So first talk today is by uh, Dr. Ha uh, Sarah Halberg, and she's going to be talking about ketogenic diet. Uh, Dr. Sarah Halberg is internationally recognized uh, leader in nutritional management of type 2 diabetes and other metabolic disease. She currently serves as the medical director for uh, Vitra Health and founded, uh, and founded uh, Indiana University Health Arnett Medically Supervised Weight Loss Program. She is primary investigator for the largest and longest ever clinical trial examining a non-surgical intervention for reversal of type 2 diabetes. Uh, uh, she is the chair of the board of director of Nutrition Coalition, a, not pro a non-profit that aims to educate the public and policymakers about the need uh, to strengthen national nutrition policies. Uh, Dr. Halberg is also a fellow of Espen Institute's a Health Innovator Fellowship and a member of Espen Global Leader Network. She's a registered exercise physiologist and fellow of the Obesity Medical Association and National Lipid Association. So welcome Dr. Halberg and over to you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. I'm gonna share my screen here, get my slides up. All right, so can you see uh, the talk? Is the screen sharing working before I begin? Yes, it's okay. working. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, well, um, first of all, I just wanna thank uh, Dr. Hamdi um, and the other organizers of this conference for inviting me to speak here on what I think is a very important um, and often misunderstood uh, topic when it comes to weight loss and specifically um, in my interest area, uh, type two diabetes, and that is ketogenic diets. Um, and so the question is, are they a fad or a revolution in obesity management? And instead of just saying obesity management, I am also going to add type two diabetes because I think this is where we will find that the um, intervention of a ketogenic diet um, is the most powerful. Um, and I hope that I am able to convince you um, that it is very appropriate for many patients by the end of this chat. All right. So quick disclosures, I am an employee of Verta Health, which is a um, full uh, comprehensive medical clinic uh, offering telemedicine um, uh, for type two diabetes. Um, I have stock options. I am also on the scientific advisory panel for the Simply Good Foods company. But my most important disclosure is that I have used a therapeutic carbohydrate restricted nutrition plan in practice with my patients for over 10 years. And what I can say with that is you can't unsee the results. So once you see someone have dramatic life changes with this type of intervention, um, it is what motivates me um, to uh, continue on with this line of practicing um, and helping patients um, really change their life. So quick for today, we're going to talk a little bit about low carb physiology and history. What is a low carbohydrate diet, which is probably the single most important take home from my talk today. A quick literature review because we won't have time um, to go over everything, but I'd like to hit some highlights. I'd like to talk about the trial that I'm the primary investigator of that um, happened at Indiana University Health um, in combination with Verta Health. Uh, I'd like to talk about the American Diabetes Association guideline change, and then we'll conclude. So really quick, and again, this is um, nothing new for the audience here, but insulin is critical. Um, when it comes to understanding why certain nutrition interventions may work and others may not work. I mean, insulin does a, is a hormone that does many things, as we all know. But one of the other primary things that we need to be considering is that it is our fat storage hormone. And of course, insulin can be high for not just years, but decades, even before a patient gets the diagnosis of prediabetes. And so many of the problems um, that patients ultimately can have when they de develop significant uh, metabolic disease, again, happen way before the time that they hit hyperglycemia. So it is in being impacted just by those high insulin levels. So I say that because so many times patients come into my office and they say, 
and they are pre diet they have pre diabetes i diagnosed them with that in the office and their answer is oh yeah you know my my primary care told me uh not to worry about that it's still just pre diabetes and i i am so um uh frustrated by that because I think that at least in this country, we don't take the diagnosis of pre-diabetes serious enough. This is the time that we really need to be intervening and reacting even before, again, hyperglycemia. So let's talk a little bit about again, why a ketogenic diet really works. And of course, we're all familiar with glucose tolerance tests and what happens, patients you know, drink glucose and their blood sugar and their insulin go up. But we don't really see fat tolerance tests. And it's really fascinating here from the study where you take a look at what happens when someone is just consuming fat. And the fact of the matter is there's not a reaction. So we don't have glucose go up. We don't have insulin go up. And that is clearly critical for a disease whose symptoms are elevated blood sugar and elevated insulin levels. For years, we've been telling people to avoid the macronutrient that actually can help control disease, can help bring the glucose and the insulin levels down. And here's another example of that. This is a study out of the University of Minnesota. And what this looked at is it looked at three different um, uh, eating patterns. So, so patients were eating either the standard diet, they were eating a complete carbohydrate free diet, which is not what I recommend and we'll talk about in a minute. And then they were also fasting. And of course, we can see the top line here with the open circles is the standard diet not surprising to any of us, big excursions when patients eat. But the really interesting thing is what happens when we have carbohydrate free or fasting, and they are almost the same. So in other words, the plummet in both glucose and insulin is just really profound. Now, again, I'll say this here and then I'll bring it up again. I don't recommend a carbohydrate free diet, but the point is when we really lower the carbohydrates, we have a fasting mimicking diet, but it's something that a patient can tolerate from a nutrition standpoint because they're not actually fast. So this goes back to the title of the talk, which is, is this a fad diet? And I will say right now, that low carbohydrate intervention is absolutely not a fad diet. It has been around for well over a hundred years. And of course, you know, the father of diabetes, um, Dr. Joslin himself utilized this. And when you look back at textbooks at the time, again, over a hundred years ago, um, these are medical textbooks on what patients should eat. And if you take a look at it, this is what an awful lot what it looks like today when we talk to patients about um, a well-formulated ketogenic diet. So instead of saying this is a fad, which it, it absolutely is not, what we have to say is we need to go back to what we used to know before the advent of medications basically made us feel that we could tell patients they could eat whatever they want as long as they were taking all these additional medications. And what we have seen over the years is that these medications are not all benign, certainly not insulin. So if we can go back to what we used to know, again, instead of continuing to consider this a fad, um, we could really make a big difference in public health. And I will tell you what I do think is a fad. And I do think what is a fad is the low fat diet. Again, especially I'm talking about here for patients who struggle with type two diabetes, the low fat diet is something that can lead to just, again, progression over time, frustration for patients because they're continuing to consume things that cause their insulin and blood sugar to go up. So if we ever use the term fad, we need to associate it much more so with a low fat diet than we do with something that has been around for well over a hundred years, something we used to know. So what is a low carbohydrate diet? And I think one of the biggest barriers in widespread use of a low carbohydrate diet is confusion about what it is. Um, and this is something that is really perpetuated even in the literature. 
Because what we see is we see um, studies come out that are definitely in the moderate carbohydrate range, um, which is up to 40% carbohydrates, which really is much closer to the standard American diet than it is to anything that is actually low carbohydrate. So it is critically important that if we're going to use the term low carbohydrate, that we're using it appropriately. And a very low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet is defined as less than 50 total grams of carbohydrates a day, or less than 10% of caloric intake. A low carbohydrate diet is anywhere from 51 to 130 grams or under 25%. So the take home, again, single most important thing here in the whole talk, anything over 25% is not a low carbohydrate diet. So what goes into a well-formulated, very low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet? And again, what I said earlier is I don't recommend a no carbohydrate diet. Okay. This is where we get a lot of our micronutrients. And so where are the carbs coming from? Protein-based foods for some, but the single most important place is vegetables, non-starchy vegetables. They are a critical, important part of a well-formulated ketogenic diet. Some nuts and seeds and fruits, and then of course, some for miscellaneous. And although we tend to start our patients with type 2 diabetes on a very low carbohydrate, not even sometimes under 50 grams, but often under 30 grams of carbohydrates total for the day, we can, depending on their metabolic recovery, add in carbohydrates later on in the game. So the biggest goal initially when we start a well-formulated ketogenic diet is getting the gl blood glucose under control. And here's another interesting thing. So as far as the percentage of fat goes, when patients who struggle with type 2 diabetes and obesity begin a well-formulated ketogenic diet, believe it or not, a lot of the fat that they are using to make ketones is not coming from the fat that they ingest compared to later on in their journey. And the reason for that is that they have a lot of weight to lose. And so they can consume less fat because they're mobilizing so much fat when they begin. And that mobilization of fat can be used to make ketone bodies in the liver. Now, as you can see here, once we hit the maintenance phase, actually then the fat percentage in the diet needs to go up because they're not mobilizing the fat um, as they were during their weight loss phase. And one of the things that I must um, address here is any concern of DKA. And in a patient with type two diabetes, again, we are nowhere near the range of DKA when it comes to ketone bodies. Specifically, we're talking about beta hydroxybutyrate. So really with our patients with type two diabetes, our goals are to get them to a um, beta hydroxybutyrate level of 0.5 millimoles and maybe up to two. Um, in patients who have metabolic disease, it is really difficult for them to get above two unless they are a really heavy exerciser. Um, and then every once in a while, someone may get up to, you know, between two and three. But as a general rule, again, we're really looking at the 0 0.5 to two range for our patients um, with type two diabetes. So I want to talk just a minute about beta hydroxybutyrate itself. So this is, again, the primary ketone body that is made when someone is restricting carbohydrates and increasing the fat in their diet. And we have so much clinical evidence that this decreases inflammation. And we also know how critical inflammation is to not only um, the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes, but of course, coronary artery disease, which is our main concern um, as far as mortality goes in our patients who struggle with type 2 diabetes. So clinical evidence that it decreases um, uh, inflammatory markers. But the thing is, we also understand the basic science of it. So it's not just, oh, you start this and we can see these biomarkers of inflammation decrease. No, we really understand the mechanism here. And it's two, the beta hydroxybutyrate is actually a direct modulator of our HDAC or histone deacetylase complex 
um, which actually is an epigenetic uh, regulator. So the beta hydroxybutyrate can turn on and turn off genes um, directly related to uh, decreased inflammation and uh, oxidative stress. And the other thing is it has a direct impact on the NLRP3 inflammasome pathway. So again, very important to understand when it comes to inflammation, elevated beta hydroxybutyrate levels that we see in our patients with type two diabetes is clinically understood and shown and also from a basic science standpoint. Um, here, I just wanna quickly look at a study that is the clinical, comparing a ketogenic diet in red to a low fat diet. 14 biomarkers of inflammation here, this is out of Jeff Volick's lab, um, were looked at. And what we can see here is that seven of the 14 inflammatory biomarkers were significantly reduced in the low carbohydrate arm. Um, seven of them didn't differ between groups, but as you can see in no um, uh, category or in no biomarker did the low fat diet outperform the ketogenic diet. So again, I'm gonna really go through this quickly because of time, um, but question is, is there science behind carbohydrate restriction for insulin resistance? Because this is something in a comment that I get all the time. Oh yeah, but we just don't have the science. Actually, that's not true. The low, a low carbohydrate diet is the single best studied nutrition intervention for type two diabetes. And this was acknowledged in the American Diabetes Association guidelines. So there is actually a significant body of evidence supporting a low carbohydrate or a well-formulated ketogenic diet for the treatment of type two diabetes. So I'm gonna run through just a couple of the really important studies. And this was a study done all the way back in 2005 by Bowden. Um, and this was a important study because it was a metabolic ward study. So they brought patients with obesity and type two diabetes into the metabolic ward for three weeks. And the first week they fed them a typical standard diet. And the last two weeks they fed them a real well-formulated ketogenic diet. And by that, I mean, they really did keep the carbohydrates down. In fact, in this study, it was less than 20 grams a day for two weeks. And the important thing that I want to point out is there's no calorie restriction. And what you will find in the literature when we're talking about type 2 diabetes and a ketogenic diet is there is essentially very few studies that actually restrict calories because you don't need it. Patients will self-restrict because of the amount of fat. Um, and so that is a very important thing from a patient st satisfaction standpoint to know. So what happened after only two weeks? Well, the graph on the right real, really here just speaks, you know, uh, mountains about what can happen and how quickly it can happen. Glucose and insulin levels plummet when you go on a low carbohydrate diet. Um, and it's really important also to take a look at what I think is maybe the most important thing is the insulin sensitivity. After only two weeks, decreased um, or insulin sensitivity increased by 75% with a euglycemic hyperinsulinemic clamp. Um, medications are able to be decreased. And then again, we see significant improvements in lipids as well. So this is a study by Eric Westman out of Duke, and this compared a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet to something that we all love, or at least generally speaking, the nutrition community will encourage, which is a low glycemic index diet, um, which may improve things. And the results of the study show that a low glycemic index diet can improve things, but not as much as a low carbohydrate diet. So we get decrease in um, blood sugar, much lower in the low carbohydrate uh, ketogenic diet arm. And we also get much more significant medication reduction. And that is clearly important for a number of reasons, um, including patient satisfaction. This is a study out of the University of Michigan, Dr. Saslow's group. Um, again, looking at a little bit longer term, comparing a moderate carbohydrate diet to a very low carbohydrate diet at a year. Um, and once again, results pan out the same. The very low carbohydrate diet brings down the um, blood sugar A1C here in this particular um, uh, image uh, much more. 
Um, this is an important one that I wanted to bring up. This is by um, Tay et al. And the reason that I think this is a very important study is it takes a look at glycemic um, uh, excursions. Um, we know that glycemic excursions have been associated with an increased risk of coronary artery disease. And what we find here um, is that comparing a low carbohydrate diet to a high carbohydrate diet, there's clearly less glycemic excursions. Um, uh, and that makes perfect sense, right? We're not eating things that are going to be causing blood sugar to be up and down all day long. And so in addition, decreasing inflammation, bringing down blood sugars, we also have to consider the impact of another, again, known risk factor for coronary artery disease, which is the fact that this can decrease the glycemic excursions as well. Um, so really quickly, I just wanted to talk about our atherogenic dyslipidemia in patients who are overweight um, and have obesity. And I wanted to, this is out of Jeff Folick's lab as well, um, take a look at the pie charts here with the low fat diet makeup and the um, uh, low carbohydrate diet makeup. And one of the things that I really want to draw your attention to not only is the macronutrient split, but is also the saturated fat content. So we have 12 grams versus 36 grams um, in the uh, low carbohydrate diet arm. Um, so this was on 40 subjects uh, for 12 weeks. And so what happened here? So we really have across the board improvement in biomarkers for metabolic disease. But what I'd really like to draw your attention to is the total saturated fat content of the blood. So when we're talking about saturated fat in the diet, right, we saw we're talking 12 versus 36. Well, if we're consuming 36 grams instead of 12, what most people would have presume is that the total saturated fat in the blood would actually be higher in the higher intake, but it's the opposite. And that is because when we are following a low carbohydrate diet, the saturated fat is actually used, okay? It's used to make ketone bodies. So what we see is that the saturated fat intake of the diet is dependent on the matrix with which it is eaten. If it, if it is eaten in the context of carbohydrate restriction, the saturated fat levels of the blood will actually fall, even though the consumption of saturated fat is very high. Um, and this isn't just the um, only study that shows that. There are a number of studies that show that. And we know, once again, when we look at risk factors for coronary artery disease, the um, saturated fat content of the blood is an independent risk factor for coronary artery disease. So this is another study very quickly that I wanted to show um, the same thing when it comes to saturated fat levels in the blood. This is a study that actually um, took a look at what happens if you don't lose weight. So the researchers spent time making sure these patients did not lose weight. All of the patients began the trial with metabolic syndrome and they were um, randomized, it was a crossover trial, to a low carbohydrate, moderate carbohydrate, or high carbohydrate diet for a month each. So only one month they were on each of these interventions. And what we can see is after only a month, take a look at how many patients no longer met the criteria for metabolic syndrome um, in comparing the three arms. So significant reduction in patients who just got rid of the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome didn't lose weight in the low carbohydrate diet arm after only one month. And when we take a look again at the, um, again, no weight loss, increased saturated fat uh, intake in the low carbohydrate uh, diet arm, what we see is that the, um, uh, saturated fat, whether you're talking about these phospholipids or the triglycerides actually decreased in the low carbohydrate diet arm. Um, this I think is a very important study um, out of uh, Dr. Shai's lab in Israel. Um, and it looked at a Mediterranean low carbohydrate diet. And quickly, I wanna point out that a low carbohydrate diet can look like anything. It can look vegetarian, it can look vegan, it can look Mediterranean. That's one of the beauties about it is we don't have to tell patients, you have to completely change the way you eat. We just have to modify some things. So a Mediterranean low carb diet is a great idea for many patients who prefer to eat that way. 
And so here they put patients either on a low fat diet or a Mediterranean uh, diet, uh, low carbohydrate for 18 months. Patients began the trial with significant um, hepatic fat content. And what we see after eight months, or excuse, excuse me, after 18 months is a significant greater reduction in the hepatic fat content in the low carbohydrate arm. Once again, going back to coronary artery disease, because that's what we're concerned about with our patients, decreasing, we know that hepatic fat content is associated with increased cardiovascular risk. So once again, um, really quickly, low carbohydrate diet, much more literature and studies done on this than other eating interventions when it comes to type two diabetes. And for anyone who's interested in learning more about how low carbohydrate diet studies compare to other eating patterns for type two diabetes, this is a paper that um, I participated in and we have all the studies that have been recommended um, by the American Diabetes Association in really table form. So you can go in and easily take a look what does the DASH diet look like? You know, what does the Mediterranean diet look like in comparison to other eating interventions? So anyone who wants more, this is a, um, a recommended uh, place to um, be able to take a look at the, the data um, in a condensed and easy to follow format. Um, very quickly, I'm gonna run through the trial data um, that we uh, studied here in uh, central Indiana in the United States, believe it or not. So a uh, study that comes not from the coasts like we usually are used to, but in the heartland um, of uh, the U.S. So a couple really important thing uh, to talk about. This was almost 400 patients in the intervention arm. Um, 262 of those had type 2 diabetes. Um, and then the rest of them had prediabetes in the intervention arm. We did have a usual care arm that we followed for the first two years um, uh, of patients who had type two diabetes. Very important, starting BMI of these patients was over 40. Um, and even more important is that the average time with diabetes was over eight years. So, you know, when you're talking about nutrition intervention trials, very often what you will see is that they cut off how long people can have diabetes for. So they want people with early onset diabetes. And anyone who's treated a patient with type 2 diabetes knows it is truly a different disease, whether you're talking about someone who is, you know, several uh, one to two years um, into their disease process versus someone who's eight, 10, 20, even 30 years into their disease process as we um, took in with our trial. And this, these patients also, a significant amount of them were on insulin. So these were, you know, again, very sick patients with type two diabetes. And so what happened? Um, well, first of all, retention, because one of the biggest important things that we hear about is people can't stick with it. That's not true. At a year in this trial, again, with an entire lifestyle intervention, 83% of our patients um, were still continuing on um, with the intervention. And at two years, 74%. And how do we know that they were still engaged? we know because we actually had a biomarker we were checking, beta hydroxybutyrate. So we could actually show that they were continuing to follow the nutrition intervention that we prescribed. And in fact, the beta hydroxybutyrate level at one year into the trial was the exact same as it was two years into the trial. So patients were able to stick with it. And of course, if we think of something as comparing this to patients taking medication at a year, um, you know, versus an entire lifestyle change, this blows away medication adherence. So this can be done if supported properly. A1C improves very rapidly, which is part of the patient satisfaction, especially not only that they have to take less medication, but the financial burden is less, and it is sustained at two years. So we get swift decrease in blood glucose um, that continues on. So quickly here in summary, 91% of insulin users at two, two years had reduced or completely eliminated their insulin. We had a 10% average weight loss, 74% of patients retained. 
And the medication reduction is across the board. So we were able to get, as you can see, especially taking a look at sulfonylureas and insulin, which can be problematic, especially in our older patients, we were able to completely eliminate or decrease such a significant amount of this medication, again, from a cost, from a side effect, from a quality of life standpoint. This is huge. So initially, our, in the first year of the trial, we had 60% of patients who we considered reversing their type 2 diabetes, meaning that they had normal A1Cs while not on any diabetes-specific medication. And one of the questions is, what happened to the other 40%? They do, did they do bad? And as you can see here, again, in the sake of time, I'm not going to read all of this, but even the patients who didn't meet the criteria for reversal had a significant improvements in their health parameters. Um, markers of fatty liver disease decreased significantly. This is an independent paper that we wrote specifically on that um, based on our results. And again, really taking a look here overall across the board, what we see is the only biomarker that actually went up is the calculated LDLC. Calculated LDLC did go up in the intervention arm, but ApoB and LDLP did not. They actually decreased, not significantly, but the important part is what everyone is concerned about is that they would skyrocket is not what happened. The only thing that went up was the calculated LDLC, not the other biomarkers. Um, this is a, just a very quick look that these results were sustained at three and a half years. This is a presentation uh, abstract that we recently made. We'll be having the three and a half and five year results published um, not too far in the future. And very, very quickly here, I wanted to touch on prediabetes because we had a number of patients with prediabetes. And our N, uh, national DPP study, the observational study, is very struggling to retain patients, 13%, whereas we can look at our results um, at two years and we have significantly more retention. And one of the things is that we focused on not weight loss like the national DPP. Our goal and our focus was on bringing patients back to normal glycemia. Um, and we were very successful in doing that and in also keeping patients from progressing. Only 3% over two years of patients in the intervention arm progressed to type 2 diabetes. And weight loss, again, even though it wasn't our primary goal, again, our goal was to bring patients back to normal glycemia, our weight loss was significant. Again, retention better, um, uh, weight loss better, and return to normal glycemia better. So patients with prediabetes, 52% of them, again, um, were returned to normal glycemia without any medication. And that is significant. And this study that very recently came out shows how significant it is because patients who have prediabetes and are able to revert to normal glycemia, even if that normal glycemia is not sustained over years and years, it makes a difference in their cardiovascular um, morbidity and mortality. So getting patients back to normal glycemia, even if it is not years and years, makes a difference in their long-term outcome. It is very important that when you are um, suggesting a lifestyle intervention, that you make sure that you have patients who are supported. For the sake of time, I don't have a, a chance to go over how many different ways that we support our patients. Um, in the trial, um, but they are given a very high touch situation. Very quickly, I want to say that low carbohydrate is now the standard of care, which is very critical. It's um, endorsed by the American Diabetes Association in both their standard of care and their every five year consensus report. Um, and the language strengthening, uh, the language has strengthened over the years, endorsing a low carbohydrate eating uh, plan. So in conclusion, carbohydrate restriction is a viable patient choice for type 2 diabetes. I agree with the previous speaker who said the heterogeneity is critical, 
There is no diet that works for everyone. There's no one size fits all diet, but a low carbohydrate diet arm is incredibly important in an armamentarium of helping to treat every individual patient and discuss this with them. Nutritional ketosis supports diabetes reversal by reducing insulin resistance and providing an alternative fuel to glucose with favorable sig signaling prop properties. Low carbohydrate nutrition plans, including ketosis, have extensive clinical evidence, and the American Diabetes Association and other organizations have now changed their guidelines to include a low carbohydrate eating pattern for type 2 diabetes treatment. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak, and I will be here to answer questions at the panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarah Halberg, for putting light on such a controversial topic. I am sure many of our concepts are clarified. I would request you to stay back for the panel discussion, which will happen after two more talks over here.